sometimes there is real wisdom and knowledge to be gained from children's bedtime story time, especially when we're talking about something like Aesop's fables. Now, of course, this does represent, in a translated and truncated form and designed for children with nice illustrations, but it does represent knowledge, wisdom, that has been around for thousands of years, 2,500 or so years, if we are to believe Aesop was an actual historical personage and all of the fables that have been attributed to him really were written by that historical personage. I don't know. I mean, we're not here to adjudicate that today. But at any rate, this has been around for thousands and thousands of years and uh, does represent very timeless knowledge that I think is still relevant to us today. And as I was going through and reading this uh, to my children, I did notice that there were a number of fables here that really do pertain to our situation <laughs> that we still find ourselves in all these thousands of years later. So I thought I would share some of these with you and maybe just cogitate a little bit on how they reflect our current reality. And I wanted to start with the fable of the cat and the mice. A sneaky old cat heard that a certain house was quite overrun with mice, so she hide herself off there as fast as her paws could take her. There were indeed plenty of mice, and the cat caught and ate them one by one. But the mice were not so silly, and soon realized that they needed to put themselves out of harm's way from the sneaky cat. So all those remaining hid in the holes behind the skirting board and would not come out. The cat thought a while and decided to play a trick on the mice. She clambered up the wall and hung herself from a peg and kept very, very still trying to pretend that she was dead. But one of the mice peeped out of a hole and said, We mice are not so silly, cat. We know you're still alive, so we will just stay where we are for a while longer until you get tired of hanging off that peg. And the cat did not catch another mouse in that house. And the moral of the story is, if you are wise, you will not be fooled by someone who has once been dangerous to you. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, a very, very good piece of advice. Absolutely, that's true. We should observe. We should see that uh, someone has fallen for some trick or someone has been uh, taken advantage of, and we should not trust that entity again. Which, of course, to my mind, brings up the entire concept of statism and all of these people who participate in the once every four year sacrament of voting at the election booth. Oh, I must cast my ballot. And yes, every politician in my entire lifetime has lied to me and, and taken advantage of my good faith and, and, and is completely corrupt to the core. But this one is different. This time it's going to be different. Tulsi 2020, guys. <laughs> I don't know. I, I do see a, an analogy there um, that I think pertains to our, our current predicament. So let's, let's look at this one, the fable of the lion and the boar. It was a very hot day and the sun was blazing down. The lion was looking forward to a deep, long drink as he padded slowly towards the pool. So too was the boar as he trotted towards the same pool. They both arrived at exactly the same time. They immediately began squabbling fiercely over who was there first and who had the most right to drink. And of course, squabbling led to fighting, and they were soon rolling around on the dusty ground, oblivious to anything other than their wish to defeat each other. But as they paused for breath, in the same instant, they both saw a most unwelcome sight. Wheeling in the sky and sitting on the rocks and in the trees, were several vultures. These horrid birds are waiting to eat whichever one of us loses the battle, grumbled the lion quietly. Well, we shan't let that happen, shall we? snorted the boar, and they both stopped quarreling immediately and shared the pool, one at each side. They both drank their fill and walked away quite contented. The hungry vultures all flew away, screeching crossly to each other. And the moral of the story is, in the face of mutual enemies, it is better to reconcile your differences. Excellent. <laughs> what a perfect encapsulation of the divide and conquer strategy that is employed against us and how to defeat it. Uh, it is something that I've talked about before, and I did do a little uh, series on this, a video series on this several years ago. But 
This is such an important point. Of course, the people who want to control and puppeteer society from on top of their, their golden pyramid want to look down and see all of us fighting with each other, taking care of each other so that they can come in and pick at our carcasses after the fight is over and uh, rob us. Uh, after we're already done fighting with each other. And that's why, of course, that's of course why we're divided along race, along sex, along gender, along every possible line that they can cut us and get us squabbling with each other so that they can come in. They're the vultures circling overhead just waiting for us to finish each other off. And uh, whoever loses is going to get uh, picked and whoever wins is going to be unable to even do anything to the vultures. Um, again, I think that's a very important lesson and one that it behooves us to remember. How about this fable, the fable of the wild boar and the fox? The fox was strolling through the forest when he came upon a wild boar who appeared to be sharpening his tusks against a tree. The fox watched from a distance, for he was aware that the wild boar needed to be treated with a certain amount of respect. But eventually his curiosity got the better of him, and he crept closer. There was no doubt about it at all. The wild boar was definitely sharpening his tusks. Excuse me for asking, but can you tell me why you're sharpening your tusks? Inquired the fox very politely. There are no hunters out today, and I can see no other danger that would threaten such a beast as yourself. The wild boar stopped what he was doing and looked at the fox. True, my friend, but the hunters will be here again, and any other danger might threaten with no warning then it would be too late for me to sharpen my tusks. And he went back to his task. The fox nodded, for he could see the sense of that, and he continued on his way, thinking how very sensible the wild boar was. And the moral of the story is, do not wait until danger is upon you before you make your preparations. Once again, this wisdom has been with us as human beings for thousands of years, probably long predating this fable. <laughs> It's so simple and self-evident that a child can immediately grasp it. Make preparations because we don't know what, is, what danger is around the corner or what we might need those preparations for uh, at a moment's notice. And yet, reflect on the fact that it has become an insult of sorts used by the mainstream media and, and other mainstream sources. Prepper. Oh, you're a prepper. You're one of those crazy preppers who makes preparations for things. <laughs> As if that is in and of itself a bad thing. <laughs> it's, they're trying to absolutely invert the basic logic, something that humans have understood for thousands upon thousands of years. It is gaslighting when they tell you, oh, you're a prepper. Oh, you're crazy. What are you doing that for? Just, uh, just another example of how reading something like this to my children, I can see immediately, I can grasp, oh yes, of course, I mean, of course, this is something that has been around for thousands of years that they're trying to denigrate as if it's something strange. <laughs> well, that gaslighting thankfully does not work on me. Let's read the fable of the wolf and the lamb. The wolf came across the lamb all alone and drinking from the stream. Aha, the wolf thought my supper. But how can I justify taking this innocent beast? He thought a while and then called out to the lamb, Lamb, you're muddying the water so I cannot drink. But the lamb replied politely, I don't think I am as I'm drinking downstream from you and anyway I only drink with the tip of my tongue. The thwarted wolf thought for a moment and then said crossly, Well, last year you were very rude to me when I passed you in the meadow. But once again, the lamb replied very politely, I was only born this spring, so I do not think it could have been me. The wolf was very angry by this time and shouted across the stream, well, you've been eating the grass in my pasture. The lamb was still very polite in his response. I have not tasted grass yet, he replied. Enough excuses, yelled the wolf. I'm not gonna go without my supper. And he leapt across the stream and that was the end of the poor innocent lamb. And the moral of the story is, if an enemy has decided to do you wrong, he will ignore any plea, no matter how just. 
how sadly true. And again, how directly does that pertain to uh, the situation we find ourselves in politically today? I mean, certainly we can look at the post 9-11 era of terror hysteria, the terror noia phenomenon that has uh, swept across the globe, but obviously has uh, been felt very strongly and keenly in the United States, where various uh, warning signs of terrorist activity have been put up to basically allow the predators of the various uh, law enforcement agencies to strike at their prey for any reason at any time whatsoever. And I've talked about this before, but the various reports that have come out over the years warning that people wearing blue jeans, uh, wearing blue jeans and chewing bubblegum and uh, quoting the U.S. Constitution, well, that's signs of terrorist activity. Actually, that's signs of just normal Americans going about their business, but they want to justify the ability to swoop down and have their way with you. So they will do so. And uh, that also, I think, is a warning not to be the lamb sitting there just calmly answering and politely uh, retorting, oh no, but that can't have been me. I was only born this spring. I only drink with the tip of my tongue. You're, that is not going to save you from the wolf once the wolf has decided it wants a piece of you. On that note, let's look at the fable of the pig and the sheep. The pig found her way into a meadow where the sheep were grazing quietly, and finding it to her liking, she stayed there for some time. But one day the shepherd came up behind the pig and went to grab her, intending to take her to the butcher. The pig squealed and struggled to get free. The sheep looked on in astonishment. Why are you making such a noise, they cried. The shepherd catches us regularly, but we don't make such a fuss. Yes, but it is quite different for you, retorted the pig, still struggling to get away from the shepherd. All he wants from you is your wool, you silly creatures. He wants me for bacon. And the moral of the story is, if it is your life that is in danger, you will shout louder than if it is just your property. A uh, very astute point, and one that I think explains some of the way that the the human management system of the would-be elite has been set up. It has been designed so that, generally speaking, for the most part, people have been able to live for generations, living their lives in this system that has been set up to control, essentially, their actions, to allow them a certain amount of prosperity, and then, of course, for that to be taken away, and then allow it to grow again in the the rise of the, the, the blowing of the bubbles and then the shearing of the sheep, the shearing of the flock as the shepherds cull and take, take away some of that prosperity for their own sake. Uh, but usually, at least in the comfort of the Western world for most of the past, most of the past century, uh, it has not gone to the extent of coming for your life. Uh, at least generally en masse. Because at that point is generally when people start to rise up, generally speaking, but not necessarily. Let's take a look at a, I think, a related tale, the fable of the tame ass and the wild ass. A wild ass was trotting down a steep path when he saw a tame ass sitting peacefully in the sun, eating from an overflowing manger of hay. My, you're a lucky fellow, said the wild ass. There you are, looking all sleek and content, and here I am, having to look for every last mouthful of food. The tame ass said nothing, but continued to munch contentedly at his hay. But the very next day, as the wild ass was trotting along the path, he met the tame ass again, and this time he was carrying a huge load of wood in two baskets across his back. Behind him walked a man with a great stick, who was shouting at the tame ass to walk faster. Ah, my friend, said the wild ass, I see now that you pay very dearly for your comfort and having plenty to eat. And he walked away, grateful for his freedom. And the moral of the story is, if you have to pay dearly for your advantages, then it is doubtful if they are a real blessing. Now that, my friends, is wisdom. But it is wisdom that I think still, to this day, a large proportion of the public would not quite understand. What price would you be willing to pay in actuality for real freedom? And that's a real question. 
that deserves a bit of contemplation. Because, of course, I think we all want to answer, well, I mean, any price, any price is worth it for freedom. But really? Do we really believe that? And what do we put up with for the convenience of, of having a car? Well, you have to feed the big oil beast. You have to have a car in the modern society. You have to have a smartphone. You have to do this. You have to do that. Well, you don't have to. The alternative is to live the life of the wild ass, which is not not a good life to lead. It's not, it's difficult. It is a lot of work. But would you be the one that would look at that and be grateful for your freedom when you see, oh, those are the chains that that person is wearing in order to have the, uh, the plentiful food every day and to live the life that they're living. Would you look at that and then be grateful for your own freedom? That's a type of wisdom that I don't know. I, I, won't, I won't make any judgments, but I imagine very few in the audience would uh, be able to share. <laughs>